on World News Tonight. Climate warning. The UN gives a stark warning on rapid changes in the global climate. Terrorist advance. Tensions rise as the Taliban advances against Afghan government forces. Desperate apology. Greek Prime Minister takes responsibility for Greek destruction. The fund raiser games. British couple makes their own Olympic games for a good cause. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look at the COVID-19 pandemic that's rampaging all around the world. With the new government regulation, Germans all over the country will be required to be tested for the COVID-19 before attending any public gatherings. For more on this, we have other there in a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Shanali. Two top members of Deutsche Chancellor Angela Merkel's Conservative Christian Democratic Union have kicked off a big debate over special rights for those vaccinated against COVID-19. Federal laws in Germany do not require people to be vaccinated or show proof of vaccination to be allowed to attend sporting events, leaving it up to the states to decide which restrictions to impose. But that could all change soon. Germany is preparing to introduce sweeping measures that could exclude unvaccinated people from many areas of public life if COVID-19 infections continue to rise. Germany's health ministry outlined proposals to parliament and representatives of the country's 16 federal states, detailing how the country should handle the pandemic in the coming months. The proposed measures would allow only those who have been vaccinated against the virus, have recovered from an infection or can provide proof of a negative test result, access to facilities including restaurants, hotels, hairdressers and sports stadiums. Large gatherings, both inside and outside, would be inaccessible to those who do not fulfill the criteria. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Aponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Continuing on in Europe, people in France will need to show a health pass to enjoy usually routine activities such as visiting a cafe or traveling to an inter on an intercity train in a plan championed by President Emmanuel Macron to squeeze COVID-19 infections and encourage vaccination. France's health passports came into effect on Monday. But for some of the workers in this cafe, which had already implemented it, there's still some confusion. Others, however, are already on board. A QR code can be obtained by completing a vaccination course or testing negative for COVID within the last 48 hours. It's now needed to take a flight or a long-haul train or bus journey. Until now, only cinemas of over 50 people needed to use the health pass, but smaller cinemas are also now included in the scheme. The move is worrying some independent operators. Aside from emergencies, those visiting sick loved ones in hospital or coming for an appointment will also need to show their codes. The measure is also in effect in shopping centres, but it will be down to individual councils to determine which centres will be covered by the scheme. Police reinforced by the military are out on an empty street in Western Sydney, making sure that hard lockdowns in is adhered to some of the Australia's most migrant-heavy neighbourhoods, where COVID-19 infections are greatest. For more on this, we have other there in a World News Special Correspondent, Timothy Phillip, who joins us now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, Shana. About three quarters of New South Wales states, nearly 5,000 active cases, come from nine Sydney local government districts. Urban sprawl stretching from about 12 kilometers southwest of the Sydney Harbour Bridge to the Blue Mountains foothills. To the east, however, on the sands of Bondi Beach, one of Sydney's wealthiest suburbs, surfers and seaside walkers jostle for space, while joggers clog the nearby promenade and fitness buffs huddle around public exercise equipment. As Australia's largest city struggles to contain its worst outbreak of the pandemic, the harsher restrictions and tougher policing in its most affected neighbourhoods have stoked resentment. That feeling is especially raw since the Delta outbreak began in Bondi with an unmasked, unvaccinated airport driver. Though the whole East Coast city of 5 million is in lockdown, around 1.8 million in its ethnically diverse, West are banned from leaving their immediate surroundings and doing any face-to-face -face work. 
Authorized workers must be tested every three days and masks are mandatory outside homes. The rest of the city is getting by with construction and property maintenance allowed, fewer movement restrictions and with masks not required outdoors. Schools which have been closed citywide since June are returning everywhere but the West. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Philip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Moving on to Asia, South Korea's economy had been recovering strongly from the pandemic, but the fourth wave of the virus brought renewed uncertainties. Uh, exports are still doing well, but in terms of domestic demand, the distancing rules stricter than ever are taking a toll. Uncertainties are running high in South Korea's economy amid a new surge in COVID-19 cases. According to the Korea Development Institute, the economy has been on a recovery track for the past few months, following strong demand for durable goods both in and out of the country. In its latest report on Sunday, it said exports showed positive signs with most items exhibiting high growth in trade volume and price. Retail sales continued to grow and the service sector also showed modest signs of recovery. However, in light of the country's fourth wave of the pandemic, Asia's fourth largest economy could be in a state of limbo. The KDI said the flare-up in virus cases and stricter social distancing measures from July might partially limit recovery in domestic demand mainly in in-person service sectors such as restaurants and retail businesses. It stressed that pandemic-induced uncertainties have weakened consumer confidence. The Composite Consumer Sentiment Index in July stood at 103.2, down more than seven points from the previous month. The state-run think tank also added that along with the spread of the virus, rising raw material prices have slowed corporate sentiment. The Business Sentiment Index on Business Conditions for Local Manufacturers dropped to 96 in August from 101 in the previous month. The BSI of non-manufacturing businesses also fell to 81, suggesting that corporate confidence is declining. A defiant president, Alexander Lukashenko, said a Belarusian sprinter defected at the Olympic Games only because she had been manipulated by outside forces and shrugged off a coordinated barrage of new Western sanction. During an hours-long press conference Monday, a defiant president, Alexander Lukashenko, shrugged off a coordinated barrage of new Western sanctions and said a Belarusian sprinter defected at the Olympic Games only because she had been manipulated by outside forces. She wouldn't do it herself. She was manipulated. It was Japan, from Tokyo, that she contacted her buddies in Poland and they told her, literally, when you come to the airport, run to a Japanese police officer and shout that those who dropped her off at the airport are KGB agents. There was not a single special service agent in Japan. We don't do such things. Belarusian sprinter Kristina Simonskaya fled to Warsaw last week following a dispute with her coaches, in which, she said, an order came from high up to send her home from Tokyo. Lukashenko spoke to reporters at length on the anniversary of an election which opponents said was rigged. Lukashenko denied being a dictator and said he had defended Belarus against opponents plotting a coup. As he spoke, the United States, Britain and Canada announced coordinated sanctions targeting the Belarusian economy and its financial sector, citing violations of human rights and election fraud. Lukashenko responded by saying Britain would choke on its measures and said he was ready for talks with the West instead of a sanctions war. Listen, you would start a third world war. Is that something you are pushing us and the Russians? Do you want to win this war? There will be no winners. If there are ones, it will not be you. So calm down. Tens of thousands of people joined street protest against Lukashenko in 2020, his biggest challenge since first taking power in 1994. He responded with a crackdown in which many opponents have been arrested or gone into exile. Lukashenko on Monday also denied involvement in the recent death of Vitaly Shishov, who led a Kiev-based organization that helps Belarusians fleeing persecution. Shishov was found hanged in Kiev. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News.
Welcome back. Greek Prime Minister apologized for failures in tackling the devastating wildfires that have burned across Greece for the past week as the country counted the cost in lost homes and livelihoods. As fires burned unabated in many parts of Greece for a seventh day, Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis on Monday went on television to apologize for failures in tackling the devastating wildfires that have sent thousands of people fleeing, destroying homes and businesses as well as huge swaths of forest land. The extent of the destruction, especially in Avia and Attica, blackens all of our hearts, and I am first to apologize for whatever weaknesses existed. I completely understand the pain of our citizens who saw their houses and property burning, the upheaval of having to abruptly leave their homes. The biggest front was on Evia, Greece's second largest island located just off the mainland east of Athens. Strong winds on Monday fueled flare-ups in Evia after appearing to ease earlier in the day. Water bombing aircraft struggled to operate because of the large plumes of smoke blanketing the area, authorities said. The fires broke out last week during Greece's worst heat wave in three decades with searing temperatures and dry heat causing tinderbox conditions. There has been growing public anger at delays and breakdowns in the government's response. Hundreds of protesters gathered outside of the parliament building in Athens on Monday. Prime Minister Mitsotakis, in his televised address, promised that mistakes would be identified and rectified and called for unity. Almost 1,000 firefighters, nine aircraft, and 200 vehicles have been sent to Greece from other European countries to help with the wildfires. In addition, Greece said on Monday it was expecting two aircraft from Turkey and an additional plane from Russia. More than 2,000 residents and tourists have been evacuated by ferry since last Tuesday. The images captured them departing against the backdrop of a dark red sky. In the world's largest and most up-to-date study on climate change, the United Nations said it's already too late to stop some of the devastating environmental impacts, but there's still a chance to keep things from getting worse. The signs are all there, with fires raging around the world, in Greece and Turkey and in California. And where there isn't fire, there's water. Once in a century, flash floods killed hundreds in Germany, Belgium, and China this summer. The climate is getting more hostile, and today the UN said it is already too late to stop some of the devastating impacts of climate change. It is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change and making extreme weather events more frequent and severe. The UN report is the world's largest and most up-to-date study on climate change. It says rising sea levels and shrinking glaciers in Arctic sea ice are irreversible for centuries or even millennia, with every region on the planet already impacted by more frequent and dangerous weather swings. But it's not entirely without hope, finding that temperatures can be stabilized if we act decisively over the next several decades. We have some good news for you. Pakistan continues its massive drive to plant 10 billion trees to reduce smog. The country's prime minister urged his citizens to heed the dire warning in a UN climate change report. Prime Minister Imran Khan made the remarks as he inaugurated what officials say is the largest urban Miyawaki forest project in the world. Using a technique pioneered by the late Japanese botanist Akira Miyawaki, the forest covers 12.5 acres and has more than 165,000 plants. The trees are expected to grow 10 times faster than normal due to the Miyawaki technique of planting them close together. The forest is one of 53 such sites in Lahore that are expected to work as carbon sinks. The city of 10 million has grappled with smog in recent years that has forced schools to close and earned in a ranking among the world's most polluted cities. The UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land. Even the starkest measures to reduce emissions, it said, would not prevent a global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and the extreme weather and rising sea levels resulting from the change. Since the tree planting drive started in 2018, the country has 1 billion more trees and is planting another 500 million during the monsoon season. In Afghanistan, the Taliban seized a sixth Afghan provincial capital following a weekend's blitz across the north that saw urban centers fall in quick succession and government struggle to keep the militants at bay. Women, men and children. 
tens of Afghans took to the streets of Kabul on Monday in show of defiance as Taliban fighters make sweeping gains across the country. Over the weekend, the militant group overran several provincial capitals, including Kunduz, and most recently, this gate to Abiyak, which is the northern provincial capital of Samangon. This in an offensive since foreign troops began a withdrawal from the war-torn country. The Afghan government forces, for their part, have been struggling to keep the fighters at bay. However, the country's interior minister continues to maintain a positive tone. Observers say the fall of these cities raises major questions about the future of the Afghan government. There's also fear that the country could be plunged into a decades-long civil conflict, leaving millions displaced, unless political talks resume. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Russian military was seen trying out Chinese tanks ahead of a joint drill. This move sent ripples through the Western world as international tensions continue to rise. Kim Yo-jong, sister of leader Kim Jong-un, said that South Korea and the United States will face even greater security threats for going ahead with scheduled joint military drills. Wildfires are sweeping across Bolivia's eastern lowlands, putting at risk thousands of hectares of an area known for its rich wildlife. The fires devastated the towns of Rebore and San Mateo's over the weekend. Moscoviets welcomed back members of the Russian Olympic Committee team returning from Tokyo. The athletes were taken to the Red Square straight from the airport, driving through Moscow for the celebration ceremony. The U.S. reported a record number of job openings with 10.1 million positions available. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics said that it's the third straight month in which the U.S. has reported record numbers. And finally tonight, many people are continuing to suffer and succumb from the Lou Gehrig's disease, but a ray of hope shine upon them as a British couple raise funds for their treatment in a fun way. About to cross the finish line. It was a photo finish as Stuart Bates and Charlotte Nichols finished the very last leg of their epic Olympic-inspired journey. Between the tears and champagne, a sense of accomplishment and relief. We've ended up doing 102 individual Olympic events in it 17 days amazing. and it feels like 200 <laughs> and I'm glad it's done but we've had the time of our lives. Wow. The couple competed in 49 sports, 102 events in just 17 days. All part of their own version of the Tokyo Games to raise money for a cure to Lou Gehrig's disease, also known as ALS. I lost my brother to this terrible disease 10 years ago when we wanted to do something massive that's never been done before. They're calling it the Spenny Olympics in honor of Bates's brother Spencer, who was an Olympic superfan. The fundraising challenge for their two-person summer games isn't for the faint of heart. Slow down, Billy. Slow down, Billy. This way. And comes with its Come fair share of scrapes and bruises. Oh. Yeah, we're good. It required months of training on everything from cycle racing to windsurfing in the English countryside. <laughs> what do I do? Yes, I have a massive phobia of fish, as ridiculous as that sounds, and I'm really glad that we managed to get the event I mean, done. you shook that off really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Had to be done. And you won gold. Yeah! <laughs> nice! Going for gold in the dozens of events only comes second to raising money. They've already received more than $100,000 in donations. We'll carry on until there's a cure, until there are treatments. We'll keep doing things. If people want us to do the winter Spenny Olympics or, or anything, we'll, yeah, we'll take things on. Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.